Hello and welcome to the Engage Brain Podcast. Today's episode is sponsored by SD Taste. SD Taste is the latest in neuroscience-based restaurant experiences. You've heard of dark tasting restaurants where you eat in the dark with the expectation that your other senses will be heightened. But we ask, why would you take away one of the most important senses in a multi-sensory experience? At our restaurant, we only deprive you of senses that are not involved in taste. Taste. Uh, which, as it turns out, isn't that many. So come down to SD Taste. It's SD for sensory deprivation, not standard definition. Because at SD Taste, all the flavors are in high definition with sensory deprivation. The perception of flavor is one of the most multi-sensory experiences in our everyday life. It's easy enough to think of flavor as the combination of taste and odor, but a number of other sensations, from the sound the food makes, to the temperature of the food, to how the food looks, and finally, how the food feels in your mouth, come together to create the sensation of flavor. With a growing number of foodie movements, people are starting to pay more attention to flavor. So today I sit down with Izzy Frosch to talk about flavor in the brain. So we're uh, here, I'm here with uh, Izzy Frosch, uh, and we're talking about multisensory perception, which sounds like a confusing topic. Yeah. Uh, but what got you interested in multisensory perception? Um, so the broader topic is really food mm-hmm. and flavor, and has somewhat shifted to obesity. But um, okay. <laughs> so I, I, I've always loved food and been very adventurous, eating and cooking, and um, at college it's kind of hard yeah. you're limited to a cafeteria and a microwave and maybe a mini fridge mm-hmm. so I think I've sort of thwarted all my sad foodness yeah. into academia and like considering food in various contexts so I took a class last fall with Dr. Wadden here at Haverford and it was an obesity seminar mm-hmm. and so that really got the ball rolling and then I was lucky enough to go to Copenhagen last semester, oh, wow. and I did a lot in regards to food and the new Nordic cuisine that is just all over the place there. Yeah. Um, so I've been really about food, and then coming in, I was thinking about what can I, you know, have peak my interest for the whole semester, and uh-huh. food seemed like a natural one, oh, flavor that, especially. Yeah, that's awesome. Did you try any lutefisk while you were in Copenhagen? Um... Oh, yeah, I did. Okay. It Yeah, it wasn't my favorite, but um, what else did I try while I was there? I had ants while I was there. Oh, wow. I was wow. lucky enough to go to Noma, mm-hmm. which is like one of the world's best restaurants. Yeah. And they're all about using only things found in Scandinavia. So, okay. like, there are no lemons, so instead yeah. they gave us ants, yeah. which tastes citrusy. So, oh, cool. And yeah. The, uh, <laughs> room, room I don't know if I'm saying it right. It's, kind of, it's kind of like a pudding um, sweet. Like the rice pudding rice with the berries. Rice pudding sweet, yeah. Yeah, I had that. Okay. That's a tongue twister. They get all Americans to say because you just can't Yeah, I don't noises. know how to think, I, yeah, I won't say it to the, embarrass myself. Uh, yeah, but. the gl- uh, guttural yeah. uh, sounds. <laughs> uh, I'm trying to think. That's all the uh, like Norwegian foods I know. Uh, you consider yourself a foodie, though? Yeah, I really like food and to eat. And yeah. Yeah, I would say so. Yeah, we had competitions when I was in college called Calf Creations, mm-hmm. where you'd try to think of uh, taking the boring calf food and turn it into, yeah. you know, something more exciting right. and well, palatable. Right, what can you manipulate? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I definitely partake in that. Yeah, my favorite uh, was my uh, Thai, um, spicy um, Thai peanut sauce that I make. So wow. take, take the peanut butter mm-hmm. from wherever, add in, uh, like, the hot chili pepper powder, uh, and um, you use that to make basically Thai peanut sauce. Nice. And then put that with noodles. It's good. I'm building into um, it. Yeah. Uh, so that's my uh, suggestion. Uh, <laughs> but let's see. Let's get into the brain then. Yeah. Uh, so with food, uh, it's not just flavor. Or I'm sorry, it is flavor, but it's not just like taste. Um, what all is it? Right. Well, taste is kind of a complex thing that we've mm-hmm. simplified a lot. Yeah. So taste is the mechanism with which you know food touches your tongue it touches your taste buds but then also you get the sense of smell from it even from inside your mouth it mm-hmm. goes retronasally yeah, retro-nasal. Yep. um and also a sort of new focus as well has been what is the effect of sound um oh. of that food. Oh, okay yeah and so all these go to different places in the brain um mainly like the hypothalamus and the reward center and various insula um but what's really interesting is that sound, whether it be background noise or the sound of other people eating it or 
the sound of the machine or mechanism making it like a coffee maker Mm -hmm. or a grill. Oh, yeah. That all affects our perception of flavor. So a really cool study that I just um, looked at. Oh, my gosh, it's pouring. Yeah. Um, We're hailing. I'm sorry, we can edit this No, out. yeah, yeah I, I'll say that I'll edit things out, but I've only done it once. That looks more like yeah. hail. Yeah, and hail and snow. snow. It's like 15 degrees outside. Yeah. Great. Good, I'm <laughs> glad I drove here. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, right, so this the, our, the sound of our food when we eat it has mm-hmm. an actually pretty significant impact on our perception of it. So yeah. in a potato chip study, okay. um, they gave participants chips to eat and also headphones to hear of other people eating the same crisp. Okay. Um, and they listened to it at different volumes and they consistently found that people who listened to the loudest crunch, crunch. of the trip um, kept on reporting that it tasted fresher and crispier, mm. which if you also think about flavor, those are not really attributes that we can tell, but yeah. they sort of reflect the multi-sensory um, nature of flavor and of itself so yeah. I thought that was really interesting because you don't often think about it but it's definitely there and I think restaurants and everything like that they've definitely picked up on it yeah. <laughs> faster than we as lay people have. right yeah I, I do sometimes get annoyed at too quiet of restaurants like when you're the only yeah. one in there and too like noisy of restaurants um, there seems to absolutely. be like this middle ground where absolutely and why is it that like hearing top 40 is sort of bizarre in a restaurant, yeah. you know, or like songs that you may recognize. You right. don't want to have that thwart your attention from the food. Yeah. yeah. It's very interesting. Yeah, it's very strange. Uh, and I was thinking of, um, like, when you watch TV and watch people eat, how that's also kind of annoying. Yeah. Uh, just because, like, the um, you are missing those sounds. And when they do add in the sounds, I can't remember what the name of the people in Hollywood that make sounds. They're like, I want to say fluffer, but that's probably a different thing in Hollywood. <laughs> um I don't know. They like make sounds like uh, oh, when a yeah, horse. Oh yeah, they'll go around and like drop a like bucket of water. For yeah. The yeah, 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 and and like do the coconuts for yeah um, horse. You know, so those people like how they um, make sounds and everything, but it doesn't quite match up to the right what the person's doing in life. Uh, so kind of yeah. strange. Uh, let's see here. You also talked about retro nasal, um, like uh, the smell of perception. Yeah. Uh, I think that's really interesting. It's very interesting, and I think that we often. Um, don't, we don't really give our nose enough credit, I think, in regards to food. And, mm-hmm. like, the easiest way to think about it is when you have a cold. Yeah. Like, your tongue is fine, mm-hmm. but still your flavor is almost completely gone from any food. And that's because your nose is stuffed and yeah. the smell cannot it's really go anywhere and you have no sense of it. So yeah. I think that, you know, you all see little kids, like, smelling their food and their mm-hmm. voice very <laughs> questionable. Yeah. But we don't really do that enough, I think, as adults. Like, yeah. it's a major part of experiencing your food and considering it. Yeah, so you kind of think of um, multi-sensory perception or flavor as, like, a stool. Mm-hmm. And when you, like, remove a, a leg from a stool, it, like, isn't safe to sit on. Certainly. Yeah, so it's not... I don't know, safer. It's not fun to eat when you lose one of those senses. Exactly. And so when thinking about the sense of hearing, if you're on an airplane, mm-hmm. there's a lot of background noise, a lot of whooshing and machinery. And apart from having microwaved meals, people will often say that it has no flavor. And a lot of people are guessing that's because it's so loud and mm-hmm. you are distracted. You might be watching TV or you're thinking about your travel. Um, so there's been a lot in regards to the effect of background noise as well. Yeah. That's a very silent leg of the stool right um how about those restaurants that uh, make you eat in the dark uh, like, yeah uh, have you seen anything about of uh, sight and uh, its contribution to flavor i i haven't been able to come across any major studies yet mm-hmm. although i'm sure that it's very significant and i think the biggest thing in regards to sight when we think about food is portion sizes mm. so there's a fantastic study that was done um in which they gave participants all their meals. They totally measured them out. That was what they were to eat for 11 days, and they were to weigh their food before and after to account for their caloric intake. And then they had two weeks to live their lives, and they Mm -hmm. came back and were given the same meals, sort of jumbled up, um, for the same amount of time, except this time the portion sizes were increased by about 50%. Oh, okay. And so people ate about... um, they ate more, they ate about 400 calories more per yeah. meal, which over the course of the time added right. up to at least um, 
4,000 calorie intake extra. Yeah. Um, and a lot of that they credit to the fact that, you know, you still have food on your plate, you're still going to keep eating it. Mm -hmm. We've been primed from childhood very often, at least here, yeah. you know, have to finish your plate. People have are starving. Plate. In yeah. Play sex. Exactly. And I think that that's really interesting, especially in regards to obesity. Mm -hmm. And so even at the end of the study, at the exit survey, participants were asked what they thought the purpose of the study was mm -hmm. and they said they thought it was about portion size but okay. they still ate more yeah so there's a very interesting disconnect there um and so i think our vision and our vision perception of food is incredibly important regarding our food behavior our yeah eating behavior. and it's interesting how the i think it's USDA, um, but some government branch has recently um, removed the food pyramid yes. and changed it to the food plate. Yes. Uh, and how that's supposed to represent a, and then like when that you look at portions like a portion of a meat is supposed to be like a deck of cards and um, I can't remember I all the ones. I heard that. Yeah, like, really uh, interesting. like six ounces of, or a portion of meat is like a deck of cards uh -huh. and like that looks very small compared right. to like your normal American barbecue. Absolutely. I mean, one of the biggest causes for the dramatic increase in obesity, at least in America, is mm -hmm. portion sizes. Mm -hmm. And it's especially in fast food places where it's so cheap, where yeah. it's a bargain to get, you know, like 50 chicken nuggets or like sure. a double cheeseburger or whatever. That's like, that makes the most financial mm -hmm. sense. But yeah. It really doesn't in the long term right. of all the health. Right. Or a uh, half a gallon of uh, soda. Yeah, like exactly. And there's a lot of pushback in regards to mm -hmm. limiting portion sizes and people, you know, if you look back to like New York a couple of years ago, yeah, right. they would not let it pass to um, limit uh, mostly soda mm -hmm. drinks. So Yeah. Uh, and it's the, interesting. just down the road on yeah. Lancaster is fuel. Mm, uh, yes. I've never been there. Yeah, it's a five like all of their um, servings or all of their what do I say, meals are under five hundred calories. Right. Uh, and they're supposed to also be made with healthy um, products. Interesting. Yeah, it's kind of like a fast, casual uh, restaurant. Uh, I haven't been there. I just walked past it. I haven't it, either. But if that's the... a competitor to, like, McDonald's mm -hmm. burger thing, I think that's great. Yeah. But I would imagine that they're probably more expensive. Yeah. And so it's kind of shifting gears. Well, we're talking about vision. You made a infographic <laughs> on uh, multisensory yes. perception. Uh, have you had any uh, feedback from... Uh, people out at, out there in the public family or friends um feedback has been pretty quiet oh, okay. it was my first infographic mm -hmm. and i think that shows um uh. but i think after i made it i realized that there's actually quite a lot of competition in regards to like food mm. and social media so like anytime i open my facebook news feed and this may be a representation of who i'm friends with okay but Every couple posts, there will be a video from Tasty, which is an offshoot mm. of BuzzFeed. Perhaps oh. this is just a reflection of who I'm uh -huh. friends with. Um, and it just basically shows how to create recipes from oh. start to finish. Okay. And perhaps it's also because I'm always friends with college students. Mm -hmm. And like I said, we're somewhat deprived of like, a true kitchen. Um, so I think that the focus in the general public is really on how to sort of create cheap eats or better mm -hmm. healthier eats and less about flavor and so I think I've reflected that in my <laughs> transitioning yeah. paper um but I think that even that quiet reaction is a reflection that we just sort of take flavor for granted mm -hmm. so yeah I also like the ones on Pinterest where you see like these beautiful creations right and then like superimposed next to it is like someone's attempt <laughs> it's yeah. awful <laughs> I yeah. like those ones definitely hard yeah and it is i think uh area of um as you're saying area of eating and our kind of daily lives that we do ignore um for the convenience of time or the uh, thought that it might cost more to get something that's better tasting absolutely um, and so what sort of uh do you think aspect of flavor or this multi-sensory perception is confusing to the public i think i think we're too busy to think about it mm. like you just said i think that if it tastes good, that's enough. Or if it does its job, that's enough. And I, I, like I said before, I really think that the people who are paying attention are companies and advertisements and restaurants. They're the ones who picked up on it and are sort of aware of this yeah. flavor perception. And I think that to be better consumers and to address the big food companies, we sort of need to take agency over our... Um, our notion of flavor and what we want and how we perceive it. So when you see like an advertisement of a gooey 
grilled cheese, you know, why is that appealing to you? And mm-hmm. yes, it's unhealthy, but sort of <laughs> what are they what are they appealing to you that you can sort of like control and be like, I could, you know, do that by myself or yeah. I could do something more healthy. Yeah, I, I'm also con- or concerned or I, I think interested in uh, kind of two separate movements. One, have you seen Soylent? Yes. Okay, so yes. it's the nutritional food replacement mm-hmm. mix uh, where they like looked at a 2,000 calorie recommendation of whatever your daily intake right. should be, which again is, is like a different research topic that's really interesting. Uh, and they just like put it into this powder form that you like mm-hmm. drink as a like right. protein shake. It has all the nutrients you may need. Yeah. It. I've heard it doesn't taste very good. Yeah, it tastes like it's sawdust or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. For, for somebody who perhaps self-identifies as a foodie, mm-hmm. the thought of wow. that kind of horrifies me because yeah. so much of food for me is pleasure and being able to create things or mm-hmm. choose things and mix up your day or whatnot. Um, so I can under I do know people who do tell me like if I could just have a pill, and, like yeah. that would be my meal, I'd be fine. They just don't get the same pleasure from right. it that I do. Um, so I think it's interesting, and it's certainly interesting in areas where there are underfed people or who are mm-hmm. under severely underweight. I think it's a good potential, but yeah. I also think that there are serious drawbacks. And not to mention, I mean, we have teeth <laughs> yeah, for a reason. Know, right. um, and there are certain... Are there, I know that there have been some critiques about, like, your jaw movements and, like, mm-hmm. various things other than just flavor that are yeah. lost with Soylent. Yeah. And other products. And so there's that movement, and then on the other side, I, I don't consider myself a foodie, but I do consider myself a beer aficionado. I don't know yes, if I can say that. Yes, I, I do as well. A uh, uh, college podcast, but <laughs> uh, and the direction that we've gone, I guess, over the last couple of decades, yeah. from mass market bland tasting yeah. water, um, like alcoholic water, to uh, being able to like identify a very particular small section of beers that uh, you like uh, for their flavor. Absolutely. And I think that's also reflective of um, a whole other movement of slow food and organic food and local food that all go to health and obesity. But I think that it's really interesting that people um, that people tend to like food and trends. There's uh, always okay. a food trend. There, if you think about healthy foods, there's always a healthy food trend in terms of kale. Um, or, you know, like, this is the healthy diet now. This is, mm-hmm. you know, we're Scandinavian now, not Mediterranean. Oh. Or, you know, whatever the new one is. And I think that people with um, various mechanisms of globalization, we have access to different kinds of foods. Mm-hmm. Like, avocados have, are just running the world now. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, you know, I went in Copenhagen. The avocados are certainly not natural there right. or native there. But they're everywhere in all the sort of like hipster shops okay. and like the uh, social attributions of various food or like being a like beer geek or like right. following the yeah. blogs or whatnot. It's it's I think that because food is by virtue a necessity and a human universal that we create a lot of social groups around it. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I think that has to do a lot and then the social groups are sort of defined by your reaction to various flavors. Yeah. Uh, so I think uh, we'll kind of start to wrap up. Uh, instead of asking some of the other questions, do you have any uh, local restaurant recommendations on the main line? Uh, let's see. On the main line, well, usually on the main line, I'll try and eat something that I don't have access to at college okay. so I can uh, validate my spending yeah. money. Yeah. Um, but I have to say my guilty pleasure is sweet green. Okay. I'm a big salad fan and a big fresh foods fan. And so sweet green creates various salads for you or you can make your own mm-hmm. they're pretty reasonable uh they're an art more okay i had their, they also have fantastic shirts with the great sayings like um beats don't kill my vibe uh-huh. um and various other things they're really fun yeah um another good place is uh what else do i like i really like the Ardmore um uh farmer's market yeah. sort of area they have a lot of, Joe. yeah exactly they have a lot of great they have great um, Middle Eastern food um, in the corner that I highly recommend. So mm-hmm. always, the good thing about them is they always have a lot, so you can then make it cover yeah. more meals. Yeah, so and I think, I think uh, Haver Farm should start having their spring greens maybe at some time yeah. soon. Uh, I know on Fridays they in the 
fall, uh, like early fall, they had a farmer's market on Fridays. Yeah. Uh, so That's always exciting. I'm expecting uh, that to start in the, the near so. future. All right. So I think we'll wrap it up there. Thank you so Great. much for Thank talking you. about Thank uh, you. First flavor. podcast. Very yeah. exciting. So thanks so much to Izzy for coming in. Uh, what a great uh, conversation and, and topic. Uh, coming to neuroscience, I don't think that I ever thought about a flavor uh, and the brain or how we're perceiving flavor. I think it's a pretty um, ununderstood uh, sensation or, or perception and something that has lots of uh, open avenues for uh, understanding and experience. Uh, there's been lots of research on um, vision, uh, a little bit less on audition, and then we kind of leave all the other senses uh, out in the wild uh, and not uh, haven't explored them uh, as much as those other senses, the easier ones to access and, and understand. Uh, so it'll be great to kind of further look to more research on our <coughs> experience of of uh, flavor in, in the mind. Uh, I do not consider myself a foodie uh, and eat almost the same thing for breakfast, lunch, and dinner every day. Uh, so uh, while uh, I'm not looking for flavor in my food, I am looking for flavor in my uh, drinks uh, as I uh, told uh, Izzy in the podcast. Uh, so uh, going to Jake's Jams, uh, as I asked Izzy about her favorite uh, places on the main line to eat, I'll give uh, some suggestions from uh, for me. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. I've really been in- enjoying uh, the uh, main line for its different offerings. Uh, in particular, Tired Hands, uh, both the Brew Cafe and the Fermentaria, uh, are favorite places of mine to eat and uh, to imbibe in adult beverages. Uh, Tired Hands has an amazing exploration of uh, different flavors and uh, different aspects of uh, beer that you don't see uh, many other places. Uh, many of their brews are small batch and uh, kind of experimental. Uh, they only have two uh, beers that they keep on uh, kind of normal rotation uh, and everything else uh, goes through fairly quickly. Uh, so uh, great uh, place to uh, look at multisensory uh, perception and the taste of beer. Uh, surprisingly, uh, maybe college students don't appreciate it, but uh, beer tasting uh, is a multisensory experience and something that uh, greatly varies with things like temperature and uh, the types of uh, ingredients being used in uh, producing that beer. Uh, so for Jake's Jams, Tired Hands. Uh, out on the main line uh, in Ardmore, uh, they have both the Brew Cafe and the Fermentaria. I also enjoy the the food at uh, Fermentaria, uh, really good tacos, uh, and uh, I really enjoy their veggie burger. Uh, so uh, that's uh, Jake's Jams. And wrapping up the show with Twitter tweets or read mail, I just looked at uh, my empty mailbox. Uh, no suggestions or questions so far, uh, and that mailbox is engagedbrainpodcast at gmail.com. I also looked at uh, Twitter tweets. I have been uh, receiving an increase in the number of followers, which has been great, uh, all the way up to 74, uh, but uh, no questions or suggestions uh, at Engaged Brain uh, on Twitter. Uh, so uh, we only have two, maybe three, two or three more uh, podcasts here with the interviews. Uh, so I'm going to start having to think of my own topics rather than uh, asking the interviewers to come up with their own, or the interviewees to come up with their own topics. Uh, so uh, l- moving forward, uh, definitely going to need some ideas for uh, different uh, podcast topics and uh, ideas. Uh, so uh, you can reach me at Engage Brain on Twitter or Engage Brain Podcast at gmail.com with any questions and definitely looking for suggestions. Uh, so that's uh, this is the Engage Brain Podcast. Thanks so much for listening.